Hi, folks. Uh, this is Larry Tagg, uh, Assistant Dean at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. And what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to provide a recording, a re-recording of a presentation that we recently provided for the USCTDA conference in Cleveland, Ohio for this year, 2022. And the title of this is Using Previously Published or To Be Published Content in LaTeX for, word for, for a Word Electronic Thesis or Dissertation. Uh, the authors of this are Shirley Hancock, our review manager, and Kelsey North, uh, one of our graduate students, and myself. I want to share my screen with everyone. First thing I want to do is introduce you to a document that we have developed for student use relative to including uh, previously published or to be published information in an appendices of an ETD. Now, the first thing we want to talk about relative to this is, is, is where it all came from. And this actually came from um, <clears throat> from some research that we were doing on looking to see how other universities were including previously published items in their manuscripts. Uh, the first thing we noticed in this research is that uh, most universities, if not all universities, are including this type of content in the body or chapters of an ETD. Uh, Shirley and I had talked about this at some length um, previously, and then we later presented this to our electronic thesis and dissertation advisory committee for their advice and, and comment on um, possibly moving this information out of the body, which we really felt that it shouldn't be in the body, and that information in the body should be reserved uh, for the student writing the ETD. <clears throat> And so in the process of doing this research and collecting information on what other universities were doing, uh, we came across an article in the um, uh, Virginia Tech ETD database that was very interesting. And I wanna show you that right quick. And I scrolled through the table of contents and all of a sudden I came to chapter four and the only thing in chapter four was an abstract. I thought, how weird, how's that possible to only have an abstract in a chapter? So I clicked on it, of course. And there was the abstract, sure enough, and it was just a regular abstract. And then all of a sudden I got to the next page and lo and behold, it's the full article that was pasted into this chapter. And I thought, well, how in the world did they do this? Well, I discovered by uh, checking a little further that it was done with images. Uh, what they did is they collected the images from this, what's probably a, a PDF of this article, and they just put the images in here. And I thought, man, that's a great idea. Let's think about that a while. So we brought that up to our committee and they agreed, man, that, that sounds like a great idea. Well, it turns out that there is an issue with it. i presented this uh, previously to the uh, US ETDA um, formatting group. And when I did, uh, one of the folks from Bowling Green State University said, wait a minute, we can't do that. Uh, we have an accessibility problem with this, this type of material. And so we've been working with that since then in terms of that particular issue, but that, that's how this whole thing evolved. And I wanted you to kind of uh, see where it came from. <clears throat> So <clears throat> that's what got us started in trying to put information uh, into the appendices. And we were trying to put it in to the appendices in the same way that um, uh, Virginia Tech was actually including. And they still, they're still doing this. And I've discovered since then that they're not the only university uh, doing this. They're actually putting um, articles as images uh, in other locations as well. Uh, other universities as well, um, which has an issue, as I said. <clears throat> now, if if you'll 
notice from from the authorship of this article, you'll notice there's one, two, three first authors, and there's one second author, and one second authorship. Um, that's we kind of have to deal with a little bit, and we've kind of proposed proposed something in terms of uh, dealing with how we we currently say that an author must be a first or a second author in order to use the material uh, directly in their manuscript. And um, we say here that students must be a first, a co-first, or a second author in order to incorporate PPSPA uh, into their ETD. If two other authors are designated as the co-first author, the student must be um, the third named in the, uh, to be considered as a second author, okay? Now, that would mean that whoever's being named as the second author really wouldn't be the second author uh, the way we're viewing this at the present time, but I think that's, that's only reasonable to take that position. Now, uh, as you might remember from the article, I won't bring it up again, but uh, the actual mentor or the PI of that research was the last author that was listed in that group. Uh, so maybe maybe we should be just looking at the first um, two or three first authors that are not not the invest the primary investigator or the PI of themselves, and that's one issue that we will be discussing later later as well. <clears throat> now, of course, as far as the style is concerned, uh, the style will be somewhat dependent upon the type of permission that we have the student has uh, for that documentation that's provided by the copyright the holder or publisher. <clears throat> now, if, this, if the author is a sole author, in other words, if the student has authored a, a manuscript, <coughs> excuse me, or they have authored a book chapter uh, all by themselves, they have a choice. <clears throat> they have the choice of placing that information in a chapter itself, or they can decide that they would rather have it in the appendices. Now, I think that, as you can well imagine, if there's a lot of tables or figures in that particular article that the, a student has, um, they would probably rather place it in the appendices rather than going through the the uh, trouble of formatting all that information into a body chapter. And that's, per that's absolutely permissible, uh, whatever they would like to do in that particular case. Now, as far as including <clears throat> information in the appendices, uh, it can be inserted as PDF, it can be inserted as a, as a Word document or a flat file. Um, which must be fully accessible. Well, if it must be fully accessible, um, the, the inserted PDF uh, can be, and uh, our review manager is going to talk about this, can be actually converted into a word type content uh, that can be included in either a, a regular Word document or it can be included into a, a LaTeX document itself since it's it's basically plain text or can, be, or can be generated into plain text. So flat files will work as well. Uh, just plain ASCII files will work uh, just as well. <clears throat> but we wanna try to make it fully accessible as much as we can. Now, the headings and, and the sections uh, titles in a manuscript uh, that has the, the uh, appendices inclusions will not show in the table of contents. So those, those headings that are in the, uh, uh, the PPSPA that are in the appendices, they will not show in the table of contents, nor will the tables or figures show in the list of tables or list of figures. It's totally independent information uh, that is in the particular appendix holding that information. <clears throat> now, if, if they have included information uh, in the body of the manuscript, whether it's a table or a figure 
uh, it will def or header, for example, it will definitely show up in the normal uh, table of contents and list of tables and uh, list of figures. <clears throat> Now, the preface that we have, which Shirley's going to talk about shortly, uh, is kind of lays the groundwork out for the document as a whole and how the um, this appendices information is actually being going to be incorporated and how it's incorporated into the manuscript. <clears throat> now, if an article uh, would make the appendix title go over three lines. Uh, then what we ask is a student name the appendix, appendix A, chapter two, article, uh, rather than the full three lines, which is uh, really excessive for the title. Um, so that's kind of the only restriction. We give some examples of permission statements that we'll use, and you have to understand that the full title is all of, always available in the permission statement itself. <clears throat> and we give us some examples, and this shows it, that the copyright permission that's given um, and the way that the copyright holder gives that permission, uh, some of them will give permission to use the article as it's published. Some of them will say we can only use the preprint. Some will indicate that we can only use the last uh, submitted item that was considered for publication. And so that house has to be considered when you craft your uh, permission statement. And it's important, we think, that you use the same language that the copyright holder uses when they give you the permission. <clears throat> now, in the chapter body itself, uh, there will be a footnote and the footnote goes down and gives a full permission statement and the full citation, including a link to that particular citation. And it will also include a link to the appendices or the appendix that actually contains uh, that particular article. <clears throat> And we talk a little bit here about the type of information that needs to be included in the introduction to a chapter. Um, <clears throat> this kind of sets the flow of the entire document up as you go through these introductions for each chapter. It kind of uh, puts them in place as to where they really should be within the document. And then you come to the next section that's called a summary in a chapter. Now, this is a short summary. It's uh, probably no more than three pages long, uh, but it's not an abstract. I showed you an abstract in the article from uh, Virginia Tech, but this is not an abstract. A summary is very different because it can contain um, links to uh, references. Um, it can contain links to images. And this is where it becomes very important relative to what's actually contained in the appendices of these particular types of articles. <clears throat> and you'll see that uh, when uh, Kelsey and Shirley uh, present their information on those particular items. <clears throat> Here we, we give some information about the call outs. Uh, for example, if you're gonna call out a figure that's in an appendices, it's going to be called out, for example, as appendix uh, figure A.1C. Um, and that would that would actually in, in LaTeX. And then in Word, it would be figure A-1C. Uh, the dash and the period is the only thing different at this particular time. <clears throat> Now, if a, if, a, if a student has written an article that hasn't not been accepted by the publisher, they may use that manuscript as a chapter 
but they can only use it as a chapter if they obtain permission from the other authors. For example, if they're only a first author and there's other authors involved, in order to use that material as a chapter, in fact, if they want to even use it in the appendix, they still have to have permission from those, those other authors before they can include it in their ETD. <clears throat> now, concluding statement, I'll read this concluding statement because I think it's important. A presentation as described above for PPSPA relating to the ETD research would strengthen the ETD's integrity in presenting more clearly the student's work and contributions. It also will shorten the corresponding uh, chapters in the body and allow it or them uh, to focus on the relationship of this research and its findings to the overall objectives and specific aims of the dissertation. Now, what does this mean for everybody involved? And everybody involved, I'm talking about the student, I'm talking about the ETD reviewers, and I'm talking about the scientific content reviewers. So it's going to shorten what the student has to do in terms of writing. In other words, just a summary is a very short summary, one or two or three pages is not much to write in the, in the chapter body. That makes it very short. But it's very important that it actually relates everything that's most important for that particular item that's now back in the appendices. Uh, and those particular references now that will be in the chapter itself, they will show up in the references for the entire manuscript. Now, the references that go with the, append with the appendices item or the appendix item will only show at the end of that particular item that's in the appendix, okay? <clears throat> and that's the same as far as the, the tables and the, and the figures as well. They only show at the end of the uh, uh, appendices manuscript, except for those that have been copied directly as images from the, uh, from the journal article. And they show kind of where they're being first mentioned. Now for, for the faculty on the committee, the students committee, this becomes very important because if the information in the appendix has already been peer reviewed and accepted by a journal, uh, there's no reason that a uh, content reviewer in the committee needs to go over in entirely everything that's in that article. It's important that they read the summary and they, they look at the uh, references to figures and tables that are in that summary. But beyond that, they really, they really don't need to, to cover the entire article. And to have that in the body just to read it is, would be a waste of their time as well as everybody else's because when Shirley starts her review process, uh, then she doesn't have to review as much. She has to just look at basically uh, what's being referred to in the summary and what's in the summary itself as far as the formatting is concerned. <clears throat> and make sure everything's in place properly in, in the appendix for that particular item. So with that, uh, let me turn this over to um, Shirley and she's gonna prevent, present uh, the way that we include this information into Microsoft Word when we're using Microsoft Word um, to generate a particular manuscript. And then following that, Kelsey will show us how this works in LaTeX. So let me stop sharing. And Shirley, I'll let you share yours. Greetings. This presentation will demo the three ways students can include their multi-authored, previously published, submitted or prepared for submission articles, their PPSPA, in the appendices of their ETDs using our Word template. <clears throat> we'll see the revisable preface, the proposed organization of each PPSPA chapter and appendix, along with some of the red guidance instructions that I've added, and three sample approaches 
for inserting articles into appendices, depending on the type document approved by the copyright holder. So let's move right over to the ETD itself. We'll see that the preface comes early in the front matter. <clears throat> this is revisable, as I mentioned. Readers don't normally stop to look at a preface. So we added a bold all caps note on PDF navigation, which is crucial for them moving around between the chapters and appendices. The navigation is dependent on Adobe Acrobat's uh, use of quick keys for going to uh, the next view, going back to the previously viewed screen. It's very easy to use both on Mac and PC uh, with the control uh, or alt key or the command key and a left arrow to go back or a right arrow to go forward. So, so the student will keep this note intact. They won't have to even think about it. It'll be in the template and they're to use it. They will only have to revise the first two paragraphs. Paragraph one introduces the organization of the dissertation as a whole. And then the second paragraph immediately points out that there will be three chapters that will be tied to articles in the accompanying appendices, which present the entirety of a, an article itself. It points out how figures are referred to uh, and they can see the links right here. If the reader chooses to uh, check those out, they have the navigation tips right here and they can do that. <clears throat> Next, let's look at the table of contents. Here, chapters four, five, and six, <clears throat> as we said, are those affected by an accompanying article in the appendix. You see that we expect there will be three headings usually, and, but sometimes uh, a student might want to add some additional information beyond the summary and that's fine. But this will provide some coherence with all of these and we'll be sure that they have included what they need to include. Appendices also will have three headings. These frankly will probably remain pretty static for most students. <clears throat> and let's, without further ado, go to chapter four and see what it looks like. Right away, we see the title of the chapter is the title of the article or an abbreviated version of that with a footnote after it going to the brief uh, permission statement that also indicates where the article um, comes from. In this case, it's reproduced from the publisher PDF, full citation information and an active link to the DOI, plus a link to the appendix. So let's just at this point, take a look at that appendix. Here immediately in the title, there's a reference back to the appropriate chapter and then the article of the title or abbreviation thereof. And a note for the benefit of the reader, reminder of how to use those quick keys. This again, uh, the student will not need to do very much with um, other than uh, include the appropriate chapter and create uh, a link back to it. Also, 
we're suggesting that they include a reference back to the preface in case uh, the reader wants more details. Each appendix will have an introduction. The student might have some comments before the presentation of the article on the second page of the appendix, but for sure, they will again have this permission statement and full citation information. So if the reader so chooses, uh, they could go to the DOI if that's appropriate. And now we're going to go back to the chapter. I'm on a PC, so what I'm doing is pressing Alt and the back arrow to go immediately back to chapter four, which is pretty slick. Um, here's a note also in the chapter, same type of thing that we had in the appendix. We don't want the reader to get frustrated with not remembering how to go back and forth and navigate. I'm going to point out this red text because currently our students who use Word do not use bookmarks and links. So in our training, we'll be teaching them how to do that because it's very easy to go back and add a bookmark either for the appendix title or for a table or figure and then come back here and at the call out, add a link to it. The introduction in the chapters will first serve as a bridge from the previous chapter uh, and lead into how this relates to the whole of the ETD. Next, they will give a formal introduction to the article and the appendix that it's in, and also point to the coming summary of the article. And again, a reminder to them that the summary of the article is to be in their voice this time. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what that summary might look like. We expect it to only be one to three pages long, so very short, <clears throat> but definitely to include references to tables and figures back in the article. And you can see how that's done here. The conclusions <clears throat> tie the particular chapter and the concepts in the article back to the goals and aims of the ETD. So everything flows along smoothly. And at the end of the conclusions can point to the next chapter and show how it builds on the, this particular chapter. So let's go look at this uh, appendix table. And you may remember that we said that this particular appendix is a PDF inserted as ping images. You can see that it's not the best quality of uh, type. Although if you increase the font size up here for visibility, it's, it is readable. However, it is not accessible to uh, readers for the visually impaired. So it's really not appropriate unless there's no other alternative way of inserting the material. And usually, I must say, there is another way that will be available. This is just to show you what we did in our text, our test. <clears throat> the link here uh, is the the page was bookmarked. So that's how we got back here. Now, uh, as you can see, it's all very clean. And here's the uh, references. 
they will not be in the uh, LOR, the list of references for the ETD, however. The final um, headings are alternative text for tables and figures referenced in chapter four because they're not visually acceptable as accessible here for the visually impaired. So um, here's the figure reference and a link back to the figure in case the reader would like to go back there. And the red instructions here tell the student exactly what the text should include if it's going to be accessible for them to see in their mind's eye what this figure looks like. And here's a reference for a table. They'll give the title of the table or figure and then the alt text. Copyright permission statement. Aha, here's another ping image. Um, but this will be the full permission statement received from the copyright holder showing exactly how the student may use this PPSPA content. So if they're going to actually modify a table or a figure to include in their chapter, that will also need to be indicated in this permission statement. <clears throat> it might be an image for open access permissions or it might be a formal statement of permission from the article, the authors of in submission or prepared for submission articles. The next example uh, shows you um, that this article had a long title. So we will only require that they say that this appendix deals with a chapter five article because Immediately here in the introduction, they will see the full article and, and you can see how long it is here. Um, this one is the final submission copy reproduced with open access permission. Um, the insertion was very easy. This, in this case, the final submission copy was in Word. The student did not know that I was going to request uh, to be able to insert this in our sample uh, our, uh, template here. So it looks exactly as he submitted it to the um, journal. If a student knew that they were going to do this, they of course could um, manipulate things a little bit differently before the insertion, but we don't ask that they do that because that would just take a little more time. And you can see that when it pulls in, Word actually does label these in the styling as heading one and heading two, but we don't want students to include those uh, in such a way that they would pull into the table of contents because it would look really bad and really unprofessional to have two or three different styles in the table of contents. So that's a, that's a nix on, on putting in any effort to do that. They can just leave it right as it is. Very readable, very totally accessible, except for the figures, of course. And they can come in here and if you can highlight text, you know that it's accessible. So they can put the bookmark right there. Now, occasionally there are some gaps in and white space in this particular method, but uh, it's not too bad. And as I say, if the reader really, uh, the student really wanted to, they could manipulate that uh, just a little bit around where they have white spaces like this. Coming on down, we see that 
they have a supplementary file. And in the supplementary file, they have some figures and tables. That's not a problem. When they refer to this, they just need to call it um, figure A, B, whatever, uh, whichever appendix it's in. And then figure one uh, hyphen S for supplementary. Of the three methods that I tested out, inserting the Word article, or it could be a um, flat file, was by far the easiest, I thought. The third method illustrated in this appendix is to insert the publisher's preprint PDF. Now, this one it needs a, a little more manipulation in Word. What the student has to do is come at the bottom of this first page and insert a section break, then uh, space down to the next page, insert a section break, and then insert the article between them. What you choose in Word is insert object and then as text. And immediately it spews in that PDF article. This is what it looks like. Totally accessible, very readable. Uh, there are some little funky things uh, like maybe not having a space between paragraphs, but it's very clear where the paragraphs are because of the indentations. Again, we don't allow students to include these first and second level heads in their table of contents, even though they pull in that way and they just need to go in and unstyle them. Some of the images are a little oversized. We don't worry about that either. And they are accessible. As you can see here, I can highlight them. If you can highlight anything in a document, it is going to be accessible to the readers uh, for those who have, are visually impaired. So of these three, I really prefer the inclusion of Word inserted either as a flat file, uh, including a Word document or as a flat file. And Kelsey will describe how she inserted articles into a LaTeX document. Kelsey, I unshared my screen. Okay. I'm gonna begin the um, PDF download from that was developed from our Overleaf template. As you scroll through, you'll see we have the same preface. Again, it's going to show you how to navigate to and from the appendices and the figures that are referenced within the, within the uh, text itself. Again, the table of contents are going to mirror the Word template that Shirley just went over. You're going to have a breakdown of the um, chapters that are going to reference previously published materials, such as this example here as an introduction, which is going to give you background information on the article and how it relates to the dissertation, a summary of the article itself, and conclusions. And if you notice, all of these are clickable links to each one of the sections itself. As you go down, again, you're not gonna have any um, figures or list of tables that do not show up within the text within the chapters, but only are referring to the figures within the appendix. 
However, if you have figures that you put into the chapter itself, they would come up to the list of figures or list of tables. Here's going to be an example for a uh, previously published article. It's going to be reference figure A. And if you just click on figure A, you see that it jumps you to figure A. This will give you the full uh, citation for this article and the clickable link to the DOI. This will take you to the um, actual article as it's published online. And if you click Alt or Control and the arrow key, it will take you back to where you just came from. Within this introduction, you're going to see there's going to be a breakdown of aims. This is going to be the aims that were sought to be established within the article itself. And then you are also going to have references. These references are going to show up within the dissertation references. Any other references that are less left out of the chapter article are going to only be within the appendix in the article itself. As we get, go down, we're going to get to the summary. Within the summary, you're going to have a breakdown of the figures and what each figure means. Each figure is going to have its call out, such as figure A1. This is going to be figure one in appendix A. And we click on it, it takes you to the beginning of figure one. In this particular, in this particular um, example article, we're taking the article itself and reformatting it into the appendix. So you're going to have exactly how it is shown either in the printed publisher manuscript or online. What is good about this is that it is very quick. You can do this very, very easily and put in a lot of data very quickly. However, there are some drawbacks. The figures are a little bit smaller and the text are a little bit smaller to be incorporated into the overleaf template itself. Again, you're going to click Alt or Control back. It's going to take you back to where you once were. All of these figures, figure A3, these are all going to take you to the exact figures themselves. And lastly, we have supplemental figure A.S1. This is mean, means supplemental figure one in appendix A. If you click on this, this is going to take you to the supplemental figure. Since this is not published within the, um, it's, it's published as supplemental figures, so a PDF that you have to download in addition to the article itself, these are going to be entered and formatted into Overleaf template. So this is not going to be a PDF or a PNG file inserted into Overleaf, but rather these images are going to be taken from that PDF you download and reinserted, reinserted and reformatted into Overleaf itself. So all of these are going to be accessible. Then we have a brief conclusion section. And this conclusion section is mainly going to focus on the dissertation as a whole and what this article brings and then introducing the next chapter. For chapter three, we're going to go a little bit differently. All of this information, the introduction, um, the publish, the, uh, I forgot to mention that the footnote here, the footnote is going to be after the article, the name or title of the article that it is referencing. And it is also going to be the title of the chapter. This footnote is going to reference what appendix this article is going to be in. So this is going to be Appendix B. If you go to Appendix B, you'll see that this is a little bit differently. This is formatted a little bit differently from the article we just saw. The article we just saw was going to be PDF templates that were taken online from the final published version of the article and inserted and printed into Overleaf itself. And I'll show you a little bit about how we did that. This, however, 
is taking the final submitted version of the article. So it was accepted at the final submission and all of the text is reinserted into Overleaf itself. And then when you get to the uh, figures, all of the figures are going to come after the text. But what is beneficial about this is that this figures are all going to take up an entire page. They're going to be much larger and they're going to be much clearer to see for the audience. Moreover, all of this text is going to be accessible. However, this takes a little bit more time and a little bit more coding to do this than the other version that we just saw. And then lastly, we are going to have the uh, publisher permissions. And the publisher permission statement is going to be in the last section of each appendix. And this is going to be taken directly from what was sent to you by the publisher and inserted into its own section of the appendix, so figure A.3. This is going to be appendix A, section three. This is going to come after the supplemental materials. This is going to tell you exactly what format you need to insert into Overleaf to um, be cooperating with the publisher agreement statement. Next, I'm going to take you over to the Overleaf template itself. What you're looking at here is the source code within Overleaf. And something really important I want to show you is that these lines 59 and down, these are how we Im imported the PNG or the PDFs from the previously published article. So you take one page and each page is inserted into the overleaf. And what is good about this is that when you get to the figures right here, you can create these hyper targets. These hyper targets are going to be labeled however you want to label them. And then you can reference these within the text. So I'm gonna take you to the text now. Give it a second to load. And here you see an example of these hyperlinks. So from that hyper target that you defined, you can type in text bold font figure. This is going to just bold font the figure and then hyperlink. This hyperlink <laughs> coordinates with the hyper target which you defined previously. And then in the second bracket, you're going to put the clickable target link that will take you to that figure that you hyper-targeted or hyperlinked. This is really important when we get up to Appendix B. Within Appendix B, this is the one that we had to format specifically into Overleaf so it can be accessible for the visually impaired. So here you have all of the text. All of this text is again going to have to be coded. So you're going to have to take in any sort of symbols like the micro symbols and reformat them into the text. This section, in order to make it not show up in the um, table of context, you're going to have to put this asterisk. This asterisk is going to say, it's going to be a new section, yes, but it is not going to show up into the table of contents. This is what I wanted to show you. So in order to format each figure, it doesn't actually take a lot 
uh, brain power or a lot of work. You just simply copy this code and then insert the figure that you defined within the figures over here. So for this figure, it's figure one, pregnenolone, figure five. And if you go down, figure one, pregnenolone, figure five is right here. You can add the caption, the label, as well as the hyper target right here. This hyper target is going to create a link that directly takes you to this full page figure that is embedded into the appendix of Overleaf itself. Importantly, this is going to save you, save you or the students a lot of time in writing their dissertation because they don't have to format every single figure or every single template into Overleaf specifically for their school, but rather format it in a general sense. So it is A, readable, B, included into the appendix in a way that represents the final submitted or final published version of their manuscript. And then simply reference it in their actual text. Their actual text is going to be very good because it is all going to be in their voice, but it is also going to display everything they understood from that manuscript that they contributed to which I find to be very important in the dissertation process. You're not just simply taking a manuscript and shoving it in there as the chapter itself, but you're describing what you did, why you did it, and how it contributes to an empty um, subject matter that you are filling with your scientific achievements. And with that, I will give the floor over to Dr. Tigg and stop my screen sharing. Thanks, Kelsey. And thanks, Shirley, that was great. Um, what we will do is this, as I said before in the, in the beginning of the uh, introduction to all of this, is this, this will be provided to the USCTDA executive director and he will post this um, in place of what was actually uh, collected during the meeting itself. Now, the only downside is that we do not have an audience with us today to actually ask us questions as this concludes. So what we will be doing is we'll be providing a link to a question form to all the attendees of this year's USCTDA uh, conference in Cleveland. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we're going to uh, sign off, and we hope we get lots of questions from everyone because the more questions we have and the more comments we have, uh, the better we can do it, be at, at trying to uh, actually improve on the uh, methodology that we have created to this point. Thank you very much. <laughs>